put the kettle on, lace up your trainers, leash up the hands, hounds, hand over the kids, get out the door. Here we are, Gary and I are back with an hour or so, definitely over an hour this week. We have so much to share with you. Keep your company, ease those aches and pains, reassure you that setting the bar low is the way to overachieve and hopefully bring a little bit of festive. We can talk about Christmas now, it's only 11 days away. Uh, festive sparkle and laughter to these cold winter days. It was awesome, Eddie, to see the charts this week. What a glow I got. What did you see in the charts, Gary? What did you see? Top of the pops. And as we say, there's only one way to go when I you're know. number one with your episode one. <laughs> Crash and burn. Oh, my goodness, mate. Yeah, we may have peaked early, but... <laughs> Just but yeah, like Christmas week. Day, there's nothing like peaking at 5 a.m. Yeah, Christmas number one. Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. That would be awesome. Anyway, back on track. This week, we have our first instalment of Brew with the Coaches. Trish, Russell and Eddie answer some of your Patreon questions. That is awesome. We've got our first instalment, too, of a new feature called T Tales from the Trails and an interview with the incredible Nikki Spinks. My goodness. Boom. Right back in. Boom. You better, you better <laughs> listen to this. We better stay number one after all this work. Crikey. <laughs> and how long have we been chatting today already? We're oh, this, I've seen this a week. lot of you. I've got the salmon mouth already going. It's dry, but I can't. I mean, I love tea, but I can't drink anymore. I need to have a little break. Otherwise, my eyeballs are going to pop out of my head. You know, I just thought, is it this time oh, last Lord. year you were on the podium for some super duper Stop massive race. it. Stop it on the podium in that super massive race where Bryn forgot to take my clothes. And so I stood in front of a whole <laughs> massive, uh, in this big like indoor arena in my, still in my running kit and all the other girls had had showers and put on makeup. That was the memory, yes, of that race. Hey. Hey. Wow. My week looked a bit different last week than that week. Yeah, yeah. Share with us what have you been up to? Oh, well, I crashed and burned a bit, to be honest. Uh, the week before, um, I'd been on the spine wreck, obviously, living the high, came off that. Thought I'd be all right because because it was such low, like, CV effort. It was a lot of, like, hiking and jogging a bit, and it didn't feel that hard or tiring. But then come Monday, I asked my legs a question, and Tuesday, I really struggled to even run for an hour. I was just like... Pfft. No level, no energy, totally flat. I honestly questioned, I was like, have I just lost all my fitness? Because this is just horrendous. Anyway, then James messaged me and was like, do you feel really tired? I was like, yes. Wednesday, I was still feeling really tired. He's like, that's cool. That's fine. I feel really tired too. Soon as you know, a mate is also feeling really tired. You feel much better. <laughs> um, as with all these things, I just kind of let it come back. The other thing I kept doing was falling asleep on the sofa. That's I was awesome. like- <laughs> sit down we have like an hour when the kids have all gone to bed where we'll watch something on netflix or something and i just could not stay awake i just kept falling asleep which is unlike me normally i love cartoon hour um so i eased myself back into it i tried not to panic and i, I feel i feel fine now um i feel great back on back on track we had a really busy week with the kids kids did their school christmas show i love it lots of the parents hate it it's really long and the story is always very loose. It's nothing to do with uh, any, it's no nativity play. The older, the uh, the oldest kids do like the story and each class does an incredible dance to an incredible French song. Ooh. Don't try and follow the story and you'll enjoy the two hours a lot more. Um, I settle in with my flask of tea and know that it's going to be two hours of my life. I'm just sitting quietly. My middle child, who the oldest and the youngest love drama, acting, singing, and they do like clubs for this. My middle child, no, if it's not got a football, a ball or a ski attached, is not interested. Said. Anyway, it got to his um it got to his bit of the show. He stepped up. They keep it a secret as well, so we've no idea what's gonna happen. He not only got up and was Doc from Back to the Future and had wheeled off this whole scene. I was like, this is incredible. Again, don't ask what Dr. Back to the Future is doing in this Christmas show. Then he did this whole jive routine with this girl. He was flinging around. They were doing jumps. He was doing like Russian kicks. I was like, this is, um, I've never seen him dance. Or And he had the moves. He was like clicking a move. <laughs> Too much Strictly has been watched by him <laughs> in the background. Like a very traditional. It was, uh... my, Bryn and I were like, look, going, this is, we didn't know. And, and lots of the mums came up after because he's like this cool, like football dude. He's really, you know, he's not, he doesn't, wouldn't ever 
have a dream of like talking to girls or he's only interested in sport. And then we were like, this is a, this is a secret. Afterwards, I was like, Rawls, you know, are you going to step up? Is it now your musical theatre career? And he's like, mum, no, we don't talk about it. We've had loads and loads of snow, uh, even more than you guys whining about it in the UK. Suddenly the snowstorm came. It literally is still snowing now. I can't, I mean, we must have had probably about a metre now. Can't see the post box anymore. Wow. It's, I know it's all under snow and it always <laughs> is like it takes the resort by surprise and they're like, oh, yes, we need the chasse-neige. We need the snow plows out. Uh, and it takes them a couple of days because if they don't clear the roads, they re- and especially because they're all mountain roads, they're on a yeah. slope. If the roads are clear, it's absolutely fine. We've got winter tires on. We can get around. Life pretty much continues as normal. Nothing is ever cancelled because of the snow. Uh, I did have a few hairy. had to go and get a child from about 10K down the valley in the dark, in a massive snowstorm. <gasps> Just holding. And I've got children in the background. Mum, mum, look, look, look. I'm like, oh, my God, if I let go of the steering wheel. Anyway, you learn to trust just like on your feet when you're running technical trails. You learn to trust, trust your winter tires and you get used to driving in those conditions um we also went for our first family ski awesome. uh, they opened up the higher bits of the resort we were a bit like oh, this is terrible we've been here seven winters now and we were a bit like can we be bothered isn't that bad anyway as soon as we got it's just getting all the kit out getting it all there the, the two boys were already skiing but we were so glad we did. We went up, went up with Evie. She crushed it. Often the first ski for the kids is a bit emotional because they're like, they can't remember when their Evie is seven. She can't remember skiing. She knows she did it, but yeah, yeah, yeah. anyway, she just popped on the skis. Off she went. I was like, oh, we're not, no, we're just easy blues, Eves. No, off we go. Off <laughs> PC we go. Uh, so we had a great day. We had our first, we had our first uh, mountain lunch, which we don't do very often. Uh, because it's so expensive. The, the if you ever come for a skiing holiday, the lunches are like how much is the coffee? Uh, you rules. oh, I didn't even have a coffee. We can't afford the drinks too. You just you get food <laughs> or you get drinks. You choose one of those. <laughs> so we skied all morning. It wasn't too cold, you know. You bar me sort of minus eight. It wasn't minus twenty one as it was on Monday. Uh, we skied all day. We came back and I did a good bit of spine training. Even though the skiing wasn't hard, it's still outside, high, two thousand meters for. Yeah. Four, five hours came back had a cup of tea put all my kit on and the rest of the family were going off to go and choose the christmas tree and put it in and i went off and did four hours oh in the dark in my kit and i did feel a bit emotional gary well, i was, like, I was awesome. like i want to go and choose a christmas tree and go and put it up and i was really sad and the snow the storm came in and i could see nothing but i wanted to check my head torch i wanted to be out in the dark um and i did that and then uh and then and then they turned on all the snow cannons so then that really limits where you can go because there are the, the massive mounds of fake snow yeah you can't really get past um so i was sort of going up and down the trail near a house and i had Bryn had the tracker on me he's like what are you doing you were like i was like i literally had one bit of path i could go up and down to try and make it for us <laughs> anyway the four hours came and i tried to time it so that i could be back in time for the start of the football which we won't mention and uh as i walked through the door they put the tree up but they had they said we waited for you mum to decorate it yeah like this christmas plant stuff it was lovely it was lovely oh, coming in yeah. from like four hours freezing cold and i wasn't freezing cold though because my kit was all brilliant and i felt great and i actually felt really happy out with my head torch in the cold in the snow i was like this this is there's something about being outside when and i could see the twinkly lights of and i was like something about being out in that sort of weather but i also knew that four hours later i was going to be home you know and that's fine <laughs> yeah. it's going to be like five days later yeah, you gotta keep going so that was... anyway that was good i was happy happy with all my kit and everything and now I'm going into my biggest week, but we'll talk about that a bit later. At the end what of the kind week. of volume did you have this week? What were we looking at? I was wise. Uh, last week was about 13 hours still. I read these. I think I know I sound such a twat, really, because I get, oh, it's an easy week, 13 hours. But a lot of that was really sl- slow because I was hiking a lot of it in the snow. And it was about uh, 100K, 60 miles and about 10,000 feet. But it was a lot of really slow stuff. So it wasn't any hard workouts or anything like that. This week will be massive. Um, and we'll talk about that a bit later. Anyway, 
What about you? Are you back on the gravy train? Are things ticking or have you (laughs) been to the gym? There's so many questions people have been asking. You know the answers of these questions, so you set me up. (laughs) I I, I, I keep the magic alive, Gary. It's a bit, you know, this relationship and we we have to pretend it's all fresh, fresh content. Well, I've not... How is the running? You know, I think think I'm quite... Not depressed, but I'm quite. I feel like I'm always quite negative. The stuff I'm projecting with my running, I think 2022 is just having a little fizzle out. I think um, that's the best way to describe it. A firework. It was a cracker. Yeah. I mentioned earlier that Tudor Hill Bellum was just there. I know, you know, I had no intention of doing it. I really didn't want to go running in December, be freezing cold for seven, eight hours, whatever it's going to be. Um, but I got four more people were entering it, people were chatting about it. So me and a bunch of others, we've all entered it. But the only real <clears throat> goal for me is just to keep myself active for the rest of the year. So I didn't kind of go completely off the rails after Lake 100. So it's done that, you know. And even though this past um, six weeks where I have kind of really lost focus really with the training, I suppose it's as best you as You haven't it. lost focus. You've just moved <clears throat> the focus into another yeah. part of your life. You do say the best things. You can. <laughs> I'm like, I'm David and Clem. But yeah, still 50 miles a week. You know, I've still been doing 50 miles a week. So I'm not going to beat myself up too much with that. But yeah, I literally reflected back. I don't remember the last time I did any form of strength and conditioning or any mobility work. Um, so that isn't great. But hopefully my plan is after to the Helvellyn, there's no point in me going down the gym now and lifting some heavy weights and injuring myself for Helvellyn on Saturday. So get Helvellyn out of the way, have a bit of a reset, Chill out over Christmas yeah. and then regroup and re- get the focus. hand in that uh, multi snack tin. <laughs> chocolate, chocolate What's your favourite heroes celebrations? I cannot choose because in each tin <clears throat> there is golden nuggets of absolute joy, and then there's the ones that as. My eldest child spat into the bin because he tried a bounty and he was like, this is the work of the oh, devil. I Who would put a bounty? bounty? Well, you need to come <clears> around because <throat> nobody likes the bounties here. Celebration, you've got Malteser, you've got Galaxy. Yeah. Ooh, you can't go Which wrong. is the one with the purple, the big purple one? The, the heroes Street. have got, oh, I mean, Quality Street. Yeah. You've got, you, you've got a range. You haven't just got chocolate, you've got toffees. Yeah. Hero, you've got twirls. You've got... Everything in miniature form. So I'm saying don't choose one. Just get all. And then you can mix and match for lunch, for pre-lunch. I've got a tin of celebrations by where I sit on the sofa in the evening that I got for my birthday. And it is a dangerous place to have when the cup of tea comes out at like 9 p.m. and the hand goes into the... Because they're only small. I mean, how many many is too many, would you say, in the evening? Oh, if I... Three, I think that's yes. a bit much. Do you know I go I go two, definitely two. A third if I can't I can't if you go over three, that's that's done. We had a Brilliant Chinese say why cap it? Why cap joy? <laughs> Unrestricted. It's like these bankers bonuses that just uh, take He'd the regulation. Say, why don't put a number on it? Just keep going while you while you feel good. <laughs> I demolished we had, we had a Chinese takeaway and I demolished a whole bag of prawn crackers. <gasps> prawn that's an that is an I would just have the prawn crackers with a bit of sauce. Oh, I don't need anything else. They were good. It's the same with uh, curry when you just get the poppadom and all the sauces. Again, be happy with that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And Rex struck gold. Actually, my dad forgot he'd put a pie in the oven and just literally had been cooking all day. But Rex um, prospered from his mistake. <laughs> he absolutely loved it. A whole pie for breakfast. He thought it was great. I love the way <laughs> that dogs love any scraps. The kids oh. always are like, can I give this to the dog, the scraps <laughs> off the plate? And I'm like, ooh. Okay, and the dogs are like, "This is the best thing." <laughs> but yeah, well, back on track. We've uh, went off off the rails again. I had a northeast uh, champs cross country this week at um, South Shields. I think it was Northeast Champs. They do another race at the uh, South Shields. I'm not sure what race you were doing. Well, they don't do the Sherman Cup at South Shields, but I think they did the Northern, I think it was the Northeast Champs uh, this year. And it was a shorter course than normal. And I heard a few people mourning about the the history of the distance. I suppose it should be 12K, not 10K. But I don't think I was alone. I was quite happy when it was only 10K and not 12K. Really good course. I bet you were still investing shorts. I have best in shorts, yeah. Gloves? No gloves, no. Never know when the camera's already. Never know when the I camera's. Know. <laughs> I'm going to do the same for the spine. Best in shorts, no gloves. Classic. 
<laughs> but yeah, and I fell down the stairs, which was like pretty rotten. I had two cups of coffee and um, oh, okay. there's it's a lot like of liquid. what happens to old people. Well, you break I, <laughs> I woke up the next day and I was thinking, why is my back hurting so much? But my wife's got massive feet um, and I'd stole <laughs> I, I, stole, say then. <laughs> I stole her socks because they look cozy. And then obviously that was a recipe for disaster going oh. down the stairs. Lost my foot and two cups of coffee. It was a comedy fall. Um, oh, the, was there the a lot of stainage was, involved? Coffee stain, everywhere. A lot of liquid, a lot of coffee everywhere. But yeah, I woke up the next day and I was really unsure why my back was so painful. But that's all it was. But only a short term injury. And I think my week definitely was not as eventful as yours, but uh, yeah, that's it. That's it for me. Time for our new segment, Brew with the Coaches. So pop the kettle on, settle down into a nice, easy pace so you can hear our dulcet tones and take a listen as we answer a Patreon member's question on having a rest day. I, again, I very rarely take a rest day. Obviously, easier days, but um, not. I never take a day off. And I know it's quite popular. I think I've heard Damien Hall talking about with some, his athletes. He always has a rest day. But this is our next question from Raven Walsh. I would like to know about rest days. I find it really hard to know when to take them. I prefer to do them on fail rather than have a set day and tend to take them when I'm feeling tired. But how do you know if you are genuinely tired and need a rest day or if you've just been a bit lacking in motivation and that getting out would actually do you good. Okay, so I, I think it's really important to take a rest day. Um, even if you're uh, feeling like you're having a good week, I still think it's really important you take a rest day. And it's it's not just, um, you know, because of the, uh, you know, the physical advantages of it, but mentally it's like you're going to go out and you're going to do some hard races. So that rest day is, I just think is super important in terms of refocusing, you know, recalibrating and um, giving you, putting yourself mentally in the best position to go out and do another hard week, you know? So I think a rest day is super important. When, when do you do it? Well, um, so I tend to work with my athletes in sort of between seven and seven and ten days on a seven to ten day rotor, depending on what they're what they're doing. Um, and some people can go longer without a rest day, but I think any any time within a seven to ten day uh, a t- ten day rotation, I think you should definitely be having a rest day. Um, I tend to do mine after a, a, your long run. Um, you could do it after you have a, just had a really hard session. Um, but I think actually it's quite beneficial to do like a recovery run, I would say the day after that. So ideally, I think if you've got to go out and do a long run, um, you're going to be out for a few hours. Your body does need to recover from that, even if you feel good and you should be feeling, you know, if you, you, you might be going out for a long run and want, want to feel good at the end of it. It's still really important to take that rest day because you even if you feel good, your body has still physically exerted a lot and will need to repair because you've been out for hours. So you'll make the most of that um, because otherwise you won't be able to capitalize on those gains. You won't be able to capitalize and um, make the adaptations in order to get the best out of the next week. So should you take a rest day, I'm firmly in the 100% yes, you should camp. Uh, If when should you take them? I would say ideally after your uh, your long run or a very hard session. Um, should you have a rest day if you're feeling a bit sick? Yeah, definitely. Because again, that's your body telling you to um, take a break. And I was really bad at this. I would say in my early years of running, I was particularly from a military background, I was like, you know, all in, go hard or go home, die. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, I look back now and I think if I'd had good coaching, I'd have been so much better and I'd have had uh, been so much more, I'd have reached so much more pot- potential. Um, the, re- the reality is you've got to look at it. You've got to look at it long term. You know, you might go out. I mean, I was in a, a cross country race yesterday and my knee is not 100 percent right. And I probably could have pushed and got a, a higher placing. Um, but it's short term. That country, cross country race means nothing in terms of my longer term. At the moment, life. though, I bet it meant quite a lot. Oh, you yeah. have to have a severe <laughs> chat with yourself to be like, slow down. It doesn't matter. You've, you've got to look long term. And, you know, taking an extra rest day um, because you're feeling a little bit under the weather 
isn't gonna isn't gonna ruin your race. What's ruining your race is gonna is 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 continuously not taking rest days and not getting um, making time for the adaptations in your body, for sure. Let, let's maybe just quickly before we go to Russell dive into what a rest day does. Mm. Um, so a rest day is when all the R's. It's recuperation. It's replenishment of your muscles. It's giving a time. It's giving a chance for those hormone levels to drop. It's also a chance for you to take a shower and put on normal clothes and catch <laughs> up on life admin and get in the good books. So it's quite a good idea if you are busy, you've got a family busy job, to plan your rest day when you know, like, I can get brownie points. I'll take the kids, love. I'll have the kids all day that day because you're going to do maybe your long run before or the weekend after. So strategically plan your rest day. And and it doesn't, if you think you might need two rest days a week, have a look at the rest of your life as well. The running, you can only train as much as you can recover from. So get lots of clients going, I could do more, I could do more. I'm like, of course you can. Everyone can do more volume. It's the actual resting, which is the bit where champions are made. This is when you replenish. This is where your body goes until you rest. The, the signals are not sent to your brain that it needs to get stronger. The signals are sent when you're go, 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 that I'm go, go, go. I don't have time. I don't have time to get stronger, to recuperate. I'm a, I'm a machine. I need to keep moving. We're going back to the caveman again. So rest days are when everything comes down. You're at your fridge. So you can replenish those glycogen stores. You can uh, you can rehydrate. You can just let your body recover and get ready to go again. Also, as Trish said, it's really important for overtraining syndrome is allowing that rest to come into a long period, looking at your whole program, not just at one piece, but as a whole puzzle. And the rest is just one of those uh, as one of those pieces. Another thing I think for resting is the ability to know that you can rest and nothing's going to happen. Lots of people find it really hard to rest because they believe the sun will not rise the next day if they don't run that day and that their whole race, which is seven months down the line, is going to be down the pan because they didn't run that day. So I think mentally it's really important to show that you have the strength not to ra- not to run and that nothing happens and in fact probably you might feel better. Now, the day after rest day, you might feel like crap, um, which is quite, and especially as you get older, when you haven't moved as much, sometimes the day after rest day, you feel a bit rubbish. It takes a while to get moved. That's all perfectly normal. Just go with it and get back in it. So don't, as Trish said, the sort of planning of the rest day is really important. So maybe like a hard session, take it, take it easy. Um, the next day, move a little bit and then take a rest day. Um, or if you know you've got a track session, then perhaps have an easy day the day before so you are moving a little bit. Um, and again, as you get older, that rest day, perhaps a little bit more rest is needed if you're busy, if you've got a young family. It's a really hard balance to go to get. I get it. And this is when coaching is really helpful, having somebody just going, it's okay to rest. It's okay to watch Netflix. Don't watch the Harry and Meghan, though. That is a waste of your life. That You'll never get back. <laughs> Russell, you are... I'm interested to know what you're going to answer to this because I don't see rest days on the gram. Occasionally. No, no, I'm not big into rest days, guys. Sorry. It's not <laughs> no, that I love it. I... I love a total. And I have to say as well, I don't do a ton of... I, I have, with spine training, had more rest than I've ever had because the volume and the pack is yeah. so tiring that yeah. you have to have the rest. Whereas on my normal running training, yeah. I would actually probably only take a rest day every couple... A total rest day every couple of weeks, and I would do it by feel. But I have been an athlete, probably like you, Russell, all my life. Yeah. And so I really am in tune. If I go out for a run, I'm not scared mm. to turn back if I feel like... A yeah. tin cam. Anyway, Russell, yeah, tell us no. tell us how you manage it and then perhaps how you manage your clients as well. Yeah, so I think you both answered great and I, I totally Thanks. agree with what you both said. Um, and so is Raven, isn't it? We're talking to Raven. Yeah. Hi, Raven, um, Russell. <laughs> and I, um, I schedule in a rest day once a month for myself, what psychologically. <laughs> One, one rest day a month. And that is because I want to know, I want to check in with myself that I can psychologically do it. If you have one rest day, you don't need any rest days. I've built my body up over 20 years so that I can run 100 miles a week, every week. And I can have an easy run. And it's if I go slow enough, it's restorative mm. for me. You know, I can feel really, really good. I can enjoy it. I can put music on. So Raven, yes, I would schedule it, 
definitely because um like um eddie and trish said then it's a psychological rest as well if you've got a run in the schedule and then you skip it you know i tend to feel a little bit guilty so if you've got a scheduled rest day then you can have a psychological rest and like eddie said you can plan your rest day a bit better rather than there was a run in there and i and i missed it um i i normally do give my clients rest days and like trish said it would be after the, the long run day and myself if i've changed my training significantly so i'm doing like dragon's back training and i've been out on the mountain for six hours yeah next day it's rest day um the difference that um in your question was how to tell the difference between tired or if you need the rest for me so that's a great question and the difference between tired and fatigue i think is what we're getting at here and if you're tired you can normally sleep your way through so if you're feeling really tired Go out and do the run anyway and see if you don't feel better after a mile. And if you don't, then, you know, quite often I'll turn around and walk home. And, you know, oh, this is a family podcast, but I'll say something along the line. F it, F this, F the universe, not my day. I walk home and then I have a really good night's sleep. And, it normally and the hit the good. calories. Often yeah, I find exactly. that yes. if I feel low, I go home. I'm like, yes. open the fridge. A yeah. thousand calories is yeah, going to yeah, be yeah. consumed totally. and I'll feel better. It's nearly yeah. always I find I'm calorie yeah. deficient yeah. when I feel it's, like that. Well, I, I find it to be both, Eddie, like okay. eat and sleep. Eat and <laughs> sleep, yeah. While <laughs> sleeping. Like... <laughs> While sleeping, you just get the child dropped. Just yeah, yeah, like half the asleep. Drops. But yeah, do both those things because everything else, all the recovery tools, they're all a bit gimmicky if you're not doing the eating and the sleeping. But the tiredness, every good athlete has been – tired is just a part of it with deep tiredness comes deep joy raven so so push through see what is on the other end of that you know that run that you are going to perhaps skip see if you can get out and do something if that's if that run is in your schedule and you'll find that you're skipping it maybe your schedule is written wrong it's not really in tune with your your work-life balance so have a look at that you know maybe take that run off the schedule for next week or just reduce it you know cut it in half but um yeah I, I would say the rest day, schedule it in, to answer your question. And if you're feeling tired and you're not sure if you should go, get out the house, do a mile. Always out the Start house. Your day, yeah. then just walk home and eat and sleep. <laughs> and you're normally another, another big part of this rest, and Russell, you just touched on it, um, is that making sure that your easy runs, like Russell can get away with only having one rest day a month because his easy runs, he does a lot of running, not with a watch, super yeah. easy. He couldn't care less of the pace um, and he just goes out and it's yeah, uh, yeah. it truly is a recovery pace. Yeah. If you're, um, so I truly believe a recovery pace. I always do the sweat test. Like you should not be sweating. I, I am a my nose as well. super oh. sweaty runner, but yeah. my recovery pace, I'll be able to wear my kit again the next day and my husband yeah. won't go what is that smell put it in the laundry basket it's so getting one. the right balance between the sessions will enable that that you won't be like all hard all hard all hard. oh my god i need a rest to recover but those easy and recovery sessions truly are easy and recovery and that will also help rebuild and the body to recover if you're just going hard all the time then often you will get stale you will get tired you will get injured mm -hmm. so again not just focus on the rest days but what you're doing in between the hard sessions and mm -hmm. the long sessions as well yeah so the opinions do that they put on extra layers for their easy run they also close their mouth with their nose so you put lots of safety valves in so that that recovery run is really a recovery run and there's evidence to show that that can help flush the lactic through the muscles quicker than <clears throat> and then complete rest yeah but it's the psychological component as well so rest is important but you just have to be in tune with where yeah where your training is right now and you need a really good sensible schedule I think as well as this is where a coach can help you when they'll say, if you've got a heavy week, you've got like the, maybe like four weeks out from race, they're going to go, you're going to feel tired this week. You need yeah. to make sure you focus on the recovery. It's okay to feel tired, but, 
those those especially for with the everyday athlete that's also not able to sit and watch Harry and Meghan all day they mm-hmm. they've got a job as well is that that only needs to be like a couple of weeks two to three weeks of your training plan the rest of it should be able to fit into your life without you having to hold on to the trolley around Sainsbury's because you're so tired mm-hmm. um and crying at kids bedtime this is not personal anecdote this is just well, yeah it sounds a little bit like a personal <laughs> Yeah, that's another one I find if I'm being really grumpy. Yeah. It's great that you've got a partner to tell you you're yeah. tired. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. You can tired. always I think bouncing yeah. it off family is always good. Mm-hmm. Like if you feel yeah. so just to and the minute you acknowledge I feel tired, yeah. off it's a bit like a therapy, isn't it? And you go they go, You could rest and you look yeah, at them yeah. like, Could I? Oh my god. Really? Yeah, it's right. and, and also like the the odd rest day as opposed to maybe two weeks of a two or three weeks off with an overuse injury or overtraining in yeah. uh, cold in drum thing. Gary, how do you how do you put your rest days in? I don't. I, I'm quite I'm quite ad hoc though. You know, if if I don't feel very if I don't feel up for it, and but you know, you said about easy runs. But or you so. get the balance as well really well with your running, in that a lot of your running is with Rexy. Yeah. And it's super easy yeah. and it's short run. And well, I was going to say, yeah, there's no sweat involved when yeah. I'm running with Rex. It's Unless you see a cat. <laughs> yeah, it's like a fart yeah. leg session. You know, um, Elliot Kachoga, he goes out with the kids, you know, on his easy runs. Yeah. And it keeps him slow, it keeps him honest, you know, because he could run five minute miling if he wanted to, but it, that holds him back. It can be really good is to go out with a training partner and chat away. But yeah, certainly have the rest day if you're feeling grumpy and tired and everything's going wrong. And take the rest day for sure. Thanks, Russell. You need to go. Thanks so Guys, much. Guys, thank you so much. All right. Love you loads. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, Bye. Bye, Russell. Thank you so much. Speak to you soon. All right. I enjoyed that idea and I hope our listeners do too. That is when I first started listening to podcasts. This is exactly why I would tune in um, to a podcast. I love Coopcast. There always seems to be some knowledge there. I think you the ones- love Coopcast. <laughs> Gary as the biggest man crush on Coopcast. <laughs> but I, I would tune in because of say um I'd be investing in the podcast. And then whatever the content was, to be honest, I would just kind of roll with it. Um, I wouldn't pick and choose it. But there was some of my old favorites. Um Rug Running, I think it's called. And they used to share some real nuggets uh training wise. So yeah, hopefully that helps our listeners to that new section. And if you are a Patreon member or thinking about becoming a Patreon member, pop on over to the Patreon page and post a question for the coaches. We will uh work our way through as many as we can over the next 10 weeks. This week, we were delighted as our first guest of on the Tea and Trails podcast, we welcomed Nikki Spinks. If you don't know anything about Nikki Spinks, uh, well, she's an incredible lady. She has women's records for many of the incredible fell running challenges, including the Ramsey Round, the Paddy Buckley Round, and the Bob Graham Round. She did at one point hold the... Ro- the women's records for all three of the rounds. I think it was up till about 2016. And she is the holder of the overall record for the double Bob Graham round and the only person ever to complete doubles of all the other two rounds. We catch up with her after her recent third place at the enormous race of the Tour de Glacier and her then her consequent first place at the Chevy Goat last weekend. Here is our chat with Nikki. Hi, Nikki. Thanks for joining us today. Hope you are well. Uh, where are you and have you been for a run today? No, I'm in South Ayrshire near Newton Stewart um, and I've been shopping. And it's a shame, actually, because it's really sunny and lovely out there. So, yeah, so run is planned for later. Oh, cool. And is it that, that recent move? You're not, I'm, I'm sure you're more kind of peak district uh, in the past. Yeah, we bought the house in 2018 and we've been renovating it. Um, there was quite a lot done to it already, like structurally, but we had to do the renovations inside, plasterboarding and painting. We moved in permanently in May, so we've been here six months. And no more farming then? No, no more farming. I just look at other people's cows. (laughs) It's nice. What's the farming around where you are now? Is it dairy farming or sheep or...? It's everything, really. Yeah, there's a dairy farmer on the way down, um, sheep mixed beef yeah quite well, a lot get, of you can get your fill then you can go around all. oh yeah <laughs> yeah have you got what have you got have you taken any animals with you to your new house just the three dogs 
be <laughs> cool. I and we, we might make a visit. Yeah, yeah, we do like a pet visit on the podcast. I saw you taking a, a drink there. Are you a tea or coffee person? A, a bit of a variety. I start off the morning with tea and then go have a coffee with lunch and then I'll go, go back to tea and then water in between. <laughs> Do you take sugar in your tea? We just spoke to somebody okay. earlier, a um, guy called Russell Bentley, and he was like saying the Kenyans have three sugars in, in, in their tea, but I don't take sugar. Yourself, Eddie? No? No, only in a race. Only in a race or after a race. Uh, Nikki, you're fresh off your win at the weekend from the recent Cheviot Goat, um, a race which you've done ha- three times, am I right? How many times have you? That was the third time, yeah. Uh, you must love bogs. I I ran over the Cheviots for the first time last week. Um, bits I loved, bits I didn't love. Uh, you might find that you feel the same way. Bits which you're like, this is the most beautiful place on earth. And then bits where you're like, this is horrendous. I hate it. Can you tell us a little bit about your race, how it panned out? I heard the weather conditions were quite challenging. Well, I think it was cold and we did actually get some sunshine in the morning. But yeah, it was... It was in the minuses when we set off at six. And it, so it was tricky to know what to wear. And initially for the morning, I was sort of too hot for a lot of it because it's quite runnable on the tracks. And um, yeah, when the Are sun came out. climbing up at the start as well. Yeah, but we were in the dark for an hour and a half at the start. But a couple of the later climbs sort of mid-morning were really quite warm and sweaty and horrible because I'd put the thicker thermals on because of the forecast. Um, for it turning to rain, which I thought would be snow on the tops, which it was. Um, yeah. So, yeah, my my clothing eventually was a really good choice, but initially it was just like, yeah, I was too hot and I couldn't really do a lot about it. But, that, yeah, I think that's what it is when you get a race like that that's so long and, and then the weather changes. And, yeah, with such cha- changeable weather on the Cheviots, you can go from sunshine like you did uh, into storm within the hour how did the race pan out did you have a sort of strategy beforehand um, of how you were going to run it how did it pan out on the day well for me I don't know the distances exactly but you get to the Cheviot Goat which must be maybe two-thirds of the way around and you've you've only gone through one bog one rough bit most of it's been quite runnable And I find that quite hard. And I also, because it's quite hard for me to run, although I have been doing a lot of trade, more of that since I came back from the glaciers, knowing that I dropped my running speed because I was doing a lot of hiking, I've been concentrating on running. So I was quite pleased to be able to sort of maintain a good pace for me while still getting a lot of energy down because I knew what was to come. And when you in those bogs, it's really hard to run, let alone eat and run. That was the plan when I set out, just run within myself for the first. And you hit the bogs, I think we were about three o'clock in the afternoon. So yeah, you've done, you've done sort of nine hours or something and you've got quite a long way to go and it's like 20 miles or so to go and it's all bogs <laughs> instead of being all runnable. But although I made the bogs runnable, but they were really... Having how done the did, race, how did before, you make the bogs runnable? Jumping, you have to use your arms and be upright. Did you have poles? Legs. No, I don't know. I think, I think if I'd been walking, then I would have used the poles more. But trying to run on the bogs, did you carry the poles? I'm always good because I'm in and out of uh, you didn't even take them with you with a 50 sort of 60 miler. I mean, I used them on the lakes in a day, yeah, last year, and they were really invaluable i used them a lot and it was it was similar conditions wet cold boggy the late in a day is almost the reverse of the cheviot goat in that the climb and the bogs come first and then yeah. you've got runnable stuff so but you've still got to keep your energy levels up whichever which way you do it but yeah but this time i decided against the poles because of the, there's more running to start yeah. with and yeah. Do you find as soon as you put as soon as I put poles in my hand, I'm happier to hike because I feel like oh the poles are in, I can mm. I they feel I feel more comfortable hiking with them than running with them, and then as soon as they're out of my hand, I'm like okay I can run, I can run. I don't know what it is something about the balance. Am I right in thinking that the route this year for the Cheviot Goat was different to previous races? Was it the same route? No. So this is the third change of the route. So in 2019, it was, well, A, we did it in reverse because the weather was coming in 
at the night. So they, they actually on the Friday night decided we were going to go in reverse. So I've never, I didn't do that route. I did that route anti-clockwise, which meant we went up the Chevy at first. Um, oh, I think I might prefer to do that. Go up at first and then... Yeah, I don't, I don't know. So it was completely different. And then in March when I did it, it was similar to this route, but they couldn't get all the permissions. There was still some forest devastation that they couldn't get round. So um, it was a shorter route. I think, I, I don't know, I remembered more bogs, but I don't, in the first half, but... It, this 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 next the last route that I've done is definitely it, the, the race is just getting longer. So the first time I did it, I think I did ten and a half hours. In March, I did twelve hours, and then okay. I've just done thirteen and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> longer and longer. But that yeah, you're right. I think that part of the country we had two bad storms, didn't we, to the end of beginning of this year. And I think all of that part of Northumberland got a real, real battering. Last year when they had to cancel in November, December, it was heartbreaking because he'd already cancelled a couple of times. This was the route, this was the race entries from the year before that he'd deferred from COVID to COVID to race permissions. And then, you know, on the night, the day I was just about to set off from here and somebody texted me to say it's been cancelled and I was gobsmacked because oh it, it was a week after all the storms and we'd heard that they were trying to, they were doing everything that they could, but the council decided to issue a state of emergency which basically invalidated their insurance. So they, they couldn't go ahead even though they've got generators in and uh -huh. change the route umpteen times it the poor guy was nearly in tears because yeah. i think financially he was nearly in ruins by this time yeah so yeah that was devastating there was one out, i could be correct me if i'm wrong actually but one out between all of the first three ladies did it were you, were you together um or was it did mm. it feel a bit of a time trial no i i set off quite steady and i see these young women as they set off, their, their heels are kicking. legs, their fresh knees. Their, their heels are kicking their backsides as they're running up the hill. <laughs> like, you know, you can go, and if I catch you, I catch you because there's no there's no competition with me and fast road runners at all. Yeah, um, that's not me. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> um, and so then when I did catch Sabrina and two other women around about the first big checkpoint I was quite surprised always gives me a boost because from there to the Chevia is not so far and then I think from the Chevia onwards I sort of think that that come you know if I've been eating and fueling and everything's gone or okay then yeah then I can sort of push a push harder do you ever get I, I, I'm not so, familiar with the where the course works but did, could you ever get any like Intel, Sabrina's closing on you, or you once you'd gone past the you, you had no knowledge of what was going on behind you. No, I've never been one to get my phone out. I've seen other people doing it, you know, looking at open tracking and oh, seeing. <laughs> For me, I would uh, never do that either. I would prefer not to know. <laughs> and again, you know, I just the the thought of. Every time we got on a track, I knew she was a much better trail runner than me. So I just thought she's catching me. So I pushed harder. And I thought if she catches me now, I know I've done all, everything that I can do. So I'm not going to, if you look at your phone and maybe she's half an hour away, you just, you'll just chill out, won't you? You just think, yeah. oh, maybe somebody else is coming along behind. Do you ever strike up a conversation? I never, I don't really get that too chatty with other competitors. If they, if I go past them or they go past me, but yeah, just curious to Sabrina, have a chew the fat for five minutes. Yeah, we were, we were sort of having a bit of a conversation, but I think I'm always in my own, yeah, my own race, thinking about what I need to eat next, where what the next bit is and, and also the navigation on that I had um, is quite tricky. You know, you've got you've got to self navigate with with GPX. So I had a handheld, and um, but I'd gone wrong, not massively, but on the last two races I've gone wrong little bits. So you, you just need to know, you know, you just need to keep your your eye on it. So I, I like to not not really involve myself in a conversation because that's when you just switch off and maybe you're right, following. Yeah. <laughs> You just end off up the wrong, down the wrong hill, uh, yeah. running 
running down the wrong way is definitely worse and, than running And on up. the TV, it's like you can be just be on the wrong side of the fence and then realise yeah. there's no way you can't get over the bogs too deep. Or I, yeah, you need to be on that line. I get that as soon as you start chatting. and Spot on. The amount of times I've been out for a recce run, we've all just been naturally away. Then it's like, oh, goodness me, we're 100 metres past the, the junction that we should have turned down. <laughs> you talked about food. I'm really interested. Do you have like a, a nutrition strategy or like you eat every 30 minutes or something like that no not really i eat just all the time um so yeah i am um, because to keep the energy up and also because i i knew it was gonna get like harder to eat later on so yeah i had a i think i, I didn't eat that much bananas sweets it's quite hard to eat and run hard at the same time kind of a couple of cans of coke some gels and some honey coated nuts and things but little little things that i could get down quite quickly and easily i actually carried i think three bars all the way around and just didn't think i could eat they were probably pretty hard if you were up in the snow as well (laughs) bars in frozen conditions hip your teeth they're not the best are they do you have a favorite part of the course no i think just after it's it is really beautiful to start with i mean i'm glad we got some views because i don't remember many views in march I, th- I think it was similar we got some views and not some views because i know i finished it was a lot warmer in march but um yeah so you can look across and the the hills are really stunning so i don't think i have a sort of favorite bit um i detest all the road <laughs> And every time we're coming down to a bit of road, I'm like, I've forgotten about this bit of road. How long does this go on for? And now it actually only goes on, I think, that a maximum a mile or something. But to me, I just, and I have to convince myself, I like go, you're not useless at road. Look, nobody's passing you. They're oh. all tired. They just they just look like they enjoy it more than you do. <laughs> just, just shut up and get your arms up. <laughs> so, but I'm always like, where can we, where can we stop? Where can we walk? <laughs> looking ahead it's amazing how those road sections even though you say they're only like a mile long but it's like wow this is a long 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 mile and when you're when you're in the bog you're like oh a bit of hard pack something please <laughs> and the minute you got on it and you have to actually run you're like oh no how much longer <laughs> you're never satisfied never <laughs> Is there any um, last one for me, actually, on, on this race before one of our Patreon questions? But do you have any standout um, highs and lows for, for, from the race? Yeah, there were some lows sort of later on when I, I hadn't really I'd stopped eating because I was trying so hard. And I'm just like, this isn't fun anymore. <laughs> this is, I thought, well, you just need to shovel some food down. And I actually, I was running with a guy, um, Howard, Howard Drake up there and it, and we'd been so since the second checkpoint, we'd been toing and throwing a bit, and then we both started helping each other because he was faster downhill, I was faster uphill. He had it. He had it on his watch. I'd done it before, and I had it a hound held. So between the two of us, we really kept each other going. Um, so that was really nice, actually, just to sort of finish with him and to to have that like chat about where the route's going and stuff. So that, yeah, that was a really good high when, when I realized that we weren't so far from the, from the finish. Yeah. I suppose the lows were actually, yeah, that I can't remember what hill we were climbing, but it was just slippery and I was swearing quite a lot. The bogs were, <laughs> my feet were frozen. The only thing I think I sh- didn't do right was I should have worn Innovate do these neoprene socks that keep your feet warm when they're wet. My feet were absolutely frozen. I've never tried them though. You you didn't you'd endorse them. They I was curious by them. Yeah. When your feet are gonna get wet and cold. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Ooh. Like I think today if I was going out, I might actually put a pair of normal socks underneath those socks for some extra, but I've just got a normal pair of socks on and my feet were frozen a lot of the time. And that just makes running hard because yeah. <laughs> I think that was, yeah, the worst bits having frozen feet. Yeah, that never gets easy. <laughs> I love that, though. You buddied up with somebody and, you know, you shared the problems together and uh, solved them together. You must have been maybe one of the only people with a handheld GPS, though. I think everyone's on their wrist these days. Yeah, I find it. I think I'm really, I prefer a map and compass. You know, if you're in the in the dark and this, I'm trying to sort of embrace the new technology. But the watch for me is too too sort of small and you can't pan in and out quick enough to see yeah. actually 
you know, am I, what am I doing here? Apart from following this arrow, am I going to go, be going up a hill, contouring a hill, yeah. down a hill? Is there a river or a, any, anything that I can look out for? Um, so yeah, I, I used the handheld on the glaciers and it was magic. Oh, interesting. <laughs> uh, Garmin 66 SR. And, and I, when I got it, I thought oh, it's really quite big and heavy, but actually it's, it's not, it's fairly chunk, but it's got buttons that you can use with mitts on. Yeah. Um, all these things that you think, oh yeah, it's big, but hey, I can I can use it with my mitts on. You yeah. can't use a sort of touch screen with mitts on. There's very few things you can actually operate with mitts on. So battery yeah. life is phenomenal. Um, yeah, and it, it so yeah, I, I definitely. I thought that when I put it in my pocket, I thought everyone's going to laugh at me with this massive handheld <laughs> thing sticking out of my pocket. <laughs> I'm sure they'll be going, if Nikki Spinks has got that, <laughs> they'll be on Amazon later. <laughs> but, but right now I had the basket. No, it's really good that um, I had a handheld one, but yeah, I, dis I dismissed it and got the wrist-based uh, technology. But I'd be curious now, you know, if they... Um, Basically, everyone had to do an event like GV Goat with a map and compass. I think it would be chaos out there up on, up on the fells. That would be quite a wild experience. Right, yeah, Jonathan Zink, our Patreon member, has asked, how on earth do you get better at running off-piste, big, ridden, tussock-type courses of the Cheviots without living there? He's so impressed. <laughs> well, has he been to Galloway? <laughs> a lot of what's around here is very... <laughs> not boggy but tussocky yeah. and it is just like lifting doing high knees my legs the next day were killing because i think i was just pulling my legs up all the time trying to run with high knees um over everything and light small steps and, and light on your feet ready to like sink at any minute um so yeah i think that's the idea i did practice quite a lot and also i, I suppose i do the drills and when i'm running on the flat even running uphill I always think of lifting my knees up to get to get them used to being lifted up. Do you do any strength and condition? And we we talked earlier with another guest about weightlifting and stuff like that. Is that something you do? I don't really. I, I think I will start because having since given up farming, I'm not doing as much manual work outside, and I am feeling that like my my glutes are getting a bit you know weaker and just getting older. I think it's, it'll benefit me if having more core strength. But yeah, I think maybe chopping wood. I need to go and do a bit more gardening. And <laughs> <laughs> well, I was I was talking about doing a farmer's carry as far as my part of my routine. But yeah, if you are physically working on a farm, you don't need to go and get a kettlebell kettlebell and go down to the gym. You were just saying about strength and conditioning leads on really well to one of my biggest question from the uh, that I wanted to ask you, Nikki, was how do you manage to stay at the front end, pointy end of the field of all these really tough endurance races? Um, and be able to, you were, not long ago, you were over in the uh, finishing third at the Tour de Glacier, and then you've been able to come back and recover and train again to take the win at Cheviots. How do you manage that uh, and stay consistent as um, as our as our age becomes higher, but you're mm. managing to stay injury-free, to still compete with people like, could be even like half your age. What, is there a secret? There's a secret, <laughs> it's not a <yet. laughs> No, I'm just thinking it's a combination of things. I think I don't overtrain. I then I came back from the glaciers and um, I knew because I'd hiked most of that week and, and a lot of the summer doing all the ascent that I needed to do to train for that, that my my short speed had gone. So I go out and, yeah, we've got forest tracks here and I go out on my own with the dogs and do tempo runs and... Um, like pretend races and things just to sharpen myself up and and I'm I was really surprised actually at the goat how well it worked so I think I just I always look at what I'm d training for or specifically and then just yeah do do specific training for that and then injuries I mean I do quite a bit of stretching go to a massage therapist sort of once every month um if not more if i've got a, a niggle which i am getting like my hamstrings at the moment are quite tight so yeah i think it's i've got the usual the wobble board the, the um, massage gun the <laughs> yeah the foam rollers 
a variety of things. Yeah, it sounds like it's a variety of training as well, mixing up going from doing something like the Tour, uh, the Tour de Glacier, which is predominantly hiking. Um, um, so you'd have built a huge endurance base from that and then going to something with the Chiviet, which is then, then you focused on a little bit more running a bit more impact angela green one of our patrons wanted to ask you how was your and i've read a little bit in your blog so perhaps i know the answer to this but how was your recovery after the tour which bit ached the most um and as you, you've already said what you did a bit differently in the build-up to the cheviot but how was your recovery after the tour did it take you a while to get over um the, the it, epic effort <laughs> it was the sleep yeah, I was um, quite useless for about a week. <laughs> just falling, just wanting to fall asleep whenever. But then, you know, going to bed on a night, and because you've disrupted your sleep for a whole week, it doesn't just swap back to being, oh, you can go to sleep for eight hours on a night. You do four hours and you wake up and then you're wide awake. Um, so, yeah, I think the sleep was really hard to, I mean, the rest of me, I had some sores on my shoulders from the pack I was carrying. And apart from that, I was sort of injury free. Even my feet were actually really good, which I was surprised at. Yeah. I fell over it on the last 10K and back. Oh, that my sounded nose. horrible. Yeah, it was pretty awful. And my nose actually, yeah, because that developed into a nice black eye. <laughs> and yeah, that took a long time to go down, at least eight weeks before oh. I was fully recovered from that. But yeah, I was really pleased with how the, the glaciers actually, you know, the effect on my body. And now I'm like, oh, you should have run more. You should have pushed yourself more. <laughs> you always say that, though, especially if you've come out of a race and the recovery, though it's been a bit bumpy, you think, is it because I didn't push myself? Or maybe it's because you just handled it so well and you ate enough and you paced it well enough that you can come away. Because it's it's hardly, I ran with um, James Elson who did the Tour de Géant last week. And he was saying like, it's only like in the last couple of weeks, he's actually felt normal and got back into training. So it's been amazing that you could recover and actually do a little training block as well towards the Cheviot's um, yeah. inspiration to us. It's such a fine line though, isn't it? You just, that, not even a percent, just that little bit more effort you maybe applied and it could have been the difference between the wheels coming off or having this uh, good race and what sounds like a pretty decent recovery. Mm. Got some Patreon questions. Should we move on to those? Yeah, so we reached out to our listeners and um, some of them got back with some questions. Our first one is from uh, Sharon Dyson. Uh, Do you prefer stage races where you get to have some rest each night or ones where you have to simply power through to get to the finish line? What I'm really asking is, is the spine race on your radar? Well, uh, um, I tried the dragons, the dragons back in 2012, and it, my feet didn't like um, maybe the length. I don't know really what was what with them, but they just got all infected and horrible, and I didn't really like it. I, I, so I think from that, I've always gone for the like straight out especially if you can manage your sleep, which I'm seeming to be getting reasonably good at, um, then, yeah, I prefer the, the straight out where the sleep is 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 your decision, how much, where you stop and how much you stop rather than a stage race, yeah. which, um, although sometimes when I'm being like the Tour de Monte Rosa, when I've been doing the full race and you go run past all these people sunning themselves, having done their, they've done their <laughs> stint for the day and they're having their tea and cake and, just think, what am I doing? <laughs> Why yeah, aren't I yeah. that with them? But maybe one, one day, but now at the moment, yeah. So the spine, it's it's an odd one because I we organise the trigger. I organise the trigger and now Mountain Rescue organise it and it's on the same day as the spine, but it starts in Marsden. So we've always passed the spine runners coming out of Edale somewhere around the snake. And, and so, and I've always sort of thought, God, running for four hours is enough for me. I wouldn't like to do any more, but, and I've, but I've always followed it. I've always known people doing it. Um, and then I watch Matt and Ellie's uh, summit media film at the, at the uh, Kendall mountain festival. And actually I, I can see now that it's not really, it's just, it's not just a race. It's more of a, a community. And I think I'd like to quite be part of that. So I'm, I'm a bit 
torn. Yeah. And then I go and do the Cheviots and I swear for hours at the box. <laughs> <laughs> and the flags, actually, I hate the flags. I think I hate the flags more than I hate the box. Yeah. <laughs> I'm with. I found when I was um, on the Cheviots or any part of that Pennine Way, whichever bit I was on, I really hated and couldn't wait to get off. And then the next bit, I was like, "Oh no, this is worse. I want to go back on the flags. At least I know my foot is gonna, even if it's gonna slip, it's gonna stay on that." But, all right. Well, we'll never say never. We might. Do yeah. Once. Watch your space. Uh, Sharon Dyson, actually, she's head of all the checkpoints, so she's a good person to know if you uh, if you are gonna ever do the yeah. spine race as well. Yeah. Jonathan Jameson, what was the most challenging part of the Barclay Marathon? Why do you think it is so difficult to complete? So complete opposite race to the Chivia and the Spine? Uh yeah, it, well, although it, it was the cold mm. and me under underestimating the cold. Um, well, all three of us that went out, um, yeah, Stephanie Case. Billy Reed and me, we all set off on that second loop with about the same amount of clothes on. And um, we got this, is, yeah, we all got sort of hypothermia really because we climbed up and it soon just dropped, the temperature dropped, the rain started, then the snow started, and we simply didn't have enough clothes on us. And it took me a while to figure out what, you know, how much Scottish mountaineering clothes I would have had to have been wearing to. Yeah, is there enough clothes? Because you're not, especially when you're looking for pages in the book, I guess you're not moving, so there's no way to generate heat. But then when you're climbing up, they're really steep, gnarly climbs, aren't they? And so you're you're getting hot and it's just might not, it's not. Yeah, way. I'm definitely going to do more. Uh, I would do more weather watching um, and spend more time. I would like, like asking my support, what's the weather going to do? and lay out the clothes and sort of, you know, trust them and say, you know, mm -hmm. what do I need? Because hopefully, you know, they're the ones that could have been looking at it. We all knew the weather was going to well, change, come, the rain was going to come in, but so we'd all take a thick waterproofs, but not enough but like base layers underneath mm. that. So once we were soaked, we were, we were cold as well. It seems to be the story, doesn't it? Quite often every time the Barclay is on, the weather... Seems to yeah. uh, play a major factor. I would totally, like yourself, I would completely underestimate how cold I could be. Uh, being a Brit, I just assume it's, it's going to be quite warm. Yeah, you think, especially <laughs> if you're from sort of Lake District area, like I'm so used to bad weather, I'll be fine. But of course, it's the it's the hours that you've already been out and then the standing still. Is it something still on your radar, Nikki? Do you want to go back and have another crack at, uh, at the Barclay? Uh, yeah, it is a little bit, yeah. Yeah, it's done sort of finished. Because you know when you've done something wrong, you think you've done something wrong, then you want to go back and put that right and then... Put a coat on. <laughs> go <back>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next question is from uh, Raven Walsh. She asks, uh, I know Nikki does a lot of running in the peaks. Does she have any route recomm recommendations to get a lot of elevation in Peak District? I had a route from Glossop that went up and sort of, it was more like a finger because it just went up and then back down and up and down. So without sort of knowing the area, it's really quite hard. But yeah, I did that one sort of during COVID quite a lot. So the Peak District from Glossop, and I think I know people who live more Edale way, you can get a lot more going up and down Mam Tor and Mam Nick and uh, yeah. Loose Hill, down and up the valleys um, like that. It doesn't, I don't know, I quite... I got to quite like my little fingered route because although you were never, it felt a bit pointless to just go down to be a hundred meters <laughs> up the next <laughs> bump that way. But it was, it was good. Yeah, it works. It's um, sometimes the best way if you want to vert, um, collect lots of vert is to do a smaller climb, um, <clears throat> but repeat it. And then it's quicker to go up and down. Also, I think it's better on the energy levels sometimes if you're yeah. training because a really long climb though, how did you train for those really long climbs? Were you out there for the summer before the Tour de Glacier, Nikki? No. How did you train for uh, the, the two, two hour plus climbing? Well, you don't get two hours unless you've got Ben Nevis really here. Yeah. Um, so I, I went to uh, Tindrum. There's quite a lot of nice hills around there that you can go up. The, the sort of not rocky, so you can choose. You can choose. I made up some good routes going round 
going around Tindrum and um, yeah, I spent quite a lot of time doing that, which was good. It was good because that's sort of three hours away from me now, so that's um, quite really handy to get to be able to get into Scotland to do some training. Can't go wrong with getting into Scotland. This leads well into Pete Walker's question. Um, what is next? What's still on your bucket list um, or top of your tick list um, and your plans for 2023? Are you ready to sort of share that yet or is it still work in progress? No, it is work in progress because I had a sort of a pot shot trying to get into the hard rock, which is really extremely hard to get into and didn't. So, Boo. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to sort of think on to what to do next, like, August, September, whether to do a round or I don't know, really. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. I don't. We can ask people, what would you like Nikki to do? Let Put it on the Facebook group and <laughs> she says rock. she'll do it. She'll do it. <laughs> Hard rock would be awesome. Though. It's just a shame. It's just a shame. It's so far away. And I think even that, like in Western States, they're so oversubscribed. Um, they have, there's some kind of, uh, I don't know what it is, but basically they just can't have too many people out on the trails, the rules of the national parks over there. So that's why it's really tricky to get an entry into those races. I yeah. wish that they did that for the trails out here and that UTMB would only allow 300 <laughs> people in. Can you imagine? They probably wouldn't bother running it. They'd be like, we're only going to make a few thousand. Shareholders wouldn't be happy with that, Eddie. Yeah, uh, I do totally agree. If it is the races that I'd look at, I would, I would definitely want an entry level of less than a thousand five hundred. Yeah, Monte Rosa, Tour Monte Rosa. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't remember what the name is. Lee Chapel Bell. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a brilliant race. Yeah, Grand Ray Pyrenees. They're all they're all trying to compete Tempers. in their own way. Yeah, but they they are way better in my Swiss mind. Peaks Trail. I mean, oh, Swiss if you're listening, there are much better races than UTMB out in uh, around Europe, around the mountains, which will have a much lower field. You'll get treated much nicer at the checkpoints. Yeah. One of the Swiss, Swiss Peak Trails checkpoints is just over the my local climb, and I went to the checkpoint. They were like, "Come in, have we have all our food?" And I was like, "I'm not doing the race." They're like, "It's fine, come in." I was like, "Imagine if that was UTMB, be all cordoned off, and you'd probably be told you weren't allowed to go near." So there are heat of other races and I agree I would now look starting to look at which is sad in our sport isn't it that you have to look at uh it's put me off any of those UTMB races of the fact that you're going to get a pole in the eye just on the start line when the, I think they've made I think they've increased UTMB numbers again for next oh year goodness. I do love the intimacy in a, of a small race you know I know Lakeland 15 mm. are quite large for this country but um yeah you couldn't just recreate that um something like UTMB it is wonderful Oh, well, Nikki, we look forward to seeing what you're going to take on. Whatever you do take take on next year will be, uh, no doubt, a huge success. We look forward to how you do it, how you manage all that. And you're such an inspiration to us women who are trying to juggle everything and you do it with such grace and such uh, modesty. She's <laughs> shaking her head. She does. She does. She, uh, she makes it all sound like it's just something that she takes in a stride. And uh, so yeah. super impressed. Thanks Gary. for your time today. Super generous. But before we let you go... It's the big quick the big hit. Five. You thought those Patreon questions were pretty deep. These these ones go deep. Right, first one: cats or dogs? Oh, dogs! Hey. No cats. Three. No cat. You must. Did you have cats on the farm? No, no cats. I we like didn't that. Have cats, actually, because we had there was a main road. Um, oh, yeah. Whereas you can teach dogs not to go on the road. Cats are harder. So. Yeah. Um, but, were the dogs uh, were the dogs working dogs on the farm? Have they retired now? No, How? they were working. Well, sort of, they thought they were working. <laughs> they had job titles. <laughs> <laughs> Was it like sit still, don't chase that, sit in the van? <laughs> It was like when I went, Shh, they knew that the cows needed moving, but as to where the cows needed to be was a bit of yeah negotiation <laughs> there but yeah no they're really good actually that that shush word if Free ever spirits. i'm out on the run and i need a cow moving i just do that and <gasps> whisk gets rid of it that's such a good idea oh wow <laughs> so are they they're having a little mini retirement now that you've moved and uh life is looking a little bit different they must yeah. you must need to exercise them maybe yeah. a bit more now they're not on the farm or are they quite happy yeah. Yeah, they love running. So yeah, they absolutely love it. As soon as I get, as soon as I go upstairs, actually, yes, 
yeah, they think I'm getting changed, come down. And, and then running. if you come down and you're in your slippers or whatever, the look on their face, they're like, no, wrong outfit. Go back Heartbreaking. Up. When you leave the yeah. house and without the dog, that is, it's not a good moment. I don't no, enjoy they're that they're like, what? Where are you going? You're like, well, I've got to go to the shops. So like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Next question is, what is your favourite type of weather? Yeah, cold and dry, I think. Yeah, oh. don't like don't like being too hot. So yeah, I think um, yeah, or wet, <laughs> hot or wet. I like the warm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm standing here, my feet are freezing. <laughs> uh, one subject you would like to learn more about? Well, since I'm looking at a acre of wait, I was going to say garden, but it's like a cross between a garden and a wasteland. It's it's gardening now. I'm going to try and plan the garden and and do the garden i'd like to look out on a garden now so yeah love it that sort yeah. of thing eddie and i come banging at your door and we are famished we want you to whip us up a lovely meal what would be your signature dish probably a beef casserole but i was gonna say cake if it wasn't for a meal i've got okay got chocolate cakes lemon drizzle cakes and oh. a bar eight Christmas cakes that I've got to ice. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a quite a cake maker. Eight Christmas cakes? You, How much Christmas cake are you going to be eating? I know, these are for gifts, you see. So oh, I'd much rather go and... I'd much rather spend a lot of time making something for somebody that they really enjoy that doesn't go in the dustbin than have to buy something for the sake of buying something. Wonderful idea. My yeah. daughter made a best friend a carrot cake, and I just thought that is such a great thing. I've still got a Christmas decoration. I've just put it up, Gary, that your daughter made me a couple of oh, years ago. Oh, yes. Yeah, cool. it's gone up on the tree. Are you feeding your Christmas cakes at the moment, Nikki? Does the uh, the brandy come out? That's what we're doing with ours at the moment. There's been so much alcohol. When I've got small children, and there's so much alcohol being poured into this cake, I'm like, to my husband, I'm like, this, they can't have this cake before they go skiing. <laughs> We had a, a friend, we were just, uh, oh my goodness, maybe we were uh, uh, kind of a Bob Graeme round recce route and he whipped out some Christmas cake for us all. And yeah, you could smell the alcohol. It was pretty strong. It was lovely though. It really hit the spot, some good energy. Last question is, uh, yeah, how do you cope with hard parts of races? Do you have a mantra, anything like that? I'm usually really quite hard on myself and so I get a bit grumpy and then I... I try and pull myself out of that and figure out why I'm grumpy and have something to eat, some sugar, and then, yeah, I mean, basically, it's just up to me to get myself out of whatever I've got myself into. <laughs> and also, I'm doing it for fun, so you can moan away and everything, but yeah. actually, this this is my choice to be here. It's, <laughs> yeah. I love that, you know. Don't project your, uh, when we're not projected, but solve your own problems. I'll get yourself out of it and totally remind yourself, I've paid money to do this. This is fun. This is what I, this is what I enjoy doing. Awesome. Can't oh. imagine Nikki Spinks being grumpy. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> nice. Just eat a bit of Christmas cake. Yeah, eat. I don't think other people would think I'm grumpy. I just go really quiet. Yeah, the um, internal monologue gets quite loud. Thank you so much for giving up the time to come on the podcast, sharing a little bit of journey, a few little nuggets of wisdom. We look forward to seeing uh, what races or adventures or challenges you'll be taking on in 2023. We even more look forward to seeing your garden flourish and uh, your new program on Gardener's World of Nikki's uh, <laughs> Roses. What have I have to I put a new page on your vlog. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you have a lovely Christmas and you get to enjoy Thank some you. of that Christmas cake as well. Thank yeah, you. All the best. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. What a coup for our first interview, Nikki Spinks. We've been so lucky there. What a treat that was. It is not every day you get to share the mics with a uh, trail running, fell running legend. Yeah, I really hope you enjoyed that. I'd love to go around to her house and have a bit of a slice of that Christmas cake and just... Yeah. Oh, they led I'll have your stew yeah. and the I lemon cake. I was a bit nervous about the beef stew. I was like, oh, no, Nikki, I don't want the beef stew. What am I going to say when you offer it to me? I'm going to have to give it to Gary, but I'll eat your Christmas cake, Gary. Cause yeah, magic. Is there any food, actually, that you eat now that you wouldn't eat as a child? Christmas cake. Oh, my maybe. gosh. 
Oh my goodness. Yeah. Anything, any grown up food. Like my taste is so different now as an adult to compare. I was really fussy when I was younger. I wouldn't, oh, I had a really bland, <laughs> I I just was like. 50 pancakes. I just just wanted toast. I literally, I literally ate toast because I went to boarding school as well and the food was terrible. I literally ate about 12 pieces of toast per meal and that was all I ate for about seven years. Um, and now my plate is full of like vegetables and nuts and grains and like seeds and I can't get enough of that. 18 year old me would have been like, are you joking? Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? How the palate changes. Oh, no way. <laughs> This is like a show of firsts today, Eddie. We've got to not only brew with the coaches, but we're now, hopefully this will grow and grow. But yeah, a new section called Tales from the Trails. And it's an opportunity for you guys uh, to share your stories from the trails. It doesn't have to be new. You know, you could have a, a story of old that you just want to share. It could be funny. Especially it could be a hilarious story that's rude and involves many <laughs> other people who'll be embarrassed here on the podcast. That's what I'm looking for, basically. <laughs> But yeah, funny, inspirational. It could be just, you know, a random act of kindness that you witnessed. Anything goes. And if you'd like to share a story, email hello at tandtrails.com and in the subject, put Tales from the Trails. It's a different email than I initially put on the Facebook. Again, this is all slight teething, but it's hello at tandtrails.com. As Gary just said, it's not the Gmail one. So please send it to that one. It's not a problem if you do. We'll take either. Don't put it on Facebook, though, because we want to keep it a secret and tell the podcast. Yeah, yeah. I've got one in. I've got one in. Uh, so here we go. It's all about the Cheviot Goat as well. From Sharon Dyson. Couple of updates uh, from the Monty and Cheviot Goat. We thought this tied in really well as well with our chat with Nikki. There was roughly a 50% success rate of runners finishing within the 24-hour period. Conditions were a bit brutal through the night and lots of people dropped out uh, or just uh, by or just after the second checkpoint. Uh, obviously, it's always at checkpoints, isn't it? Get a warm and cozy, like, I'm not going out there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But lots of talk about signing up for next year to even the score the main talking was shoe gate one guy finished wearing only one shoe it came off in a bog but his feet were that cold he didn't even immediately realize oh that he lost it goodness he ran the last 10 miles with only <laughs> one shoe but he uh but he still picked up his medal oh, wow. <sighs> that is amazing Another guy ran about 17 miles with a shoe, which was losing its sole. He had to vet wrap it on to stop it from coming off already. Another guy lost both soles off his walking boots, but thankfully the insoles were still attached. A bit like running in slippers. Wow. My minus 10 degrees registered on top of Hedge Hope Hill overnight, along with driving sleek. A proper, proper winter ultra. Uh, it sounds like people's shoes fell apart. The bog ate yeah. them. The bog and the, the bog cold. acid. We've heard about this. We have. Do you know I I rinse my shoes every night, thinking of you, Gary, when I did my spine recce to get rid of the bog. Um, Can you imagine being oh, a poor marshal out there? Oh my goodness! I love man. that she has sent me some pictures as well. I have to put them on Facebook when this goes out off Shoegate. Um, gosh, well done to the man who. <laughs> I wonder when he realised he didn't have a shoe. <laughs> What would you do, Gary? Would you carry on? Well, I'm just thinking as you're saying it, how do you solve that problem? You know, we talk about quite often. What did if you during the spine? It wasn't just 10 miles to finish. You lost a shoe and you didn't realise. What yeah, what's the admin? You get little 100, you quite often have a spare pair of shoes. At, you'd uh, go past somebody and you'd go, can I use your shoe? What size feet? Would you share it with everyone else <laughs> if they ask? <laughs> yes. Okay. I'm going to use your shoe. I am actually going to take spare trainers in my... Yeah drop bag for such emergency i hope i don't lose a shoe but if you're the guy that lost the shoe <laughs> make yourself known yeah. tell us you lost it. tell us if you ever found it because that's an expensive bit of kit to lose in the bog i'd be devastated or maybe tell me where you left it and if i've still got my wits about me if i find it i'll get it seven yeah. <laughs> oh great that's awesome thanks sharon Oh, we've had an action. I wonder what, I've not done the editing yet, obviously, but I wonder how long this show is going to last because it feels like it's been a mega busy show. Wowzers. But yeah, what have you got coming up this week? Big Miles? 
Big Miles. Oh. I'd love to say summer spi- smiles. Spine smiles. <laughs> Spine smiles. <laughs> Spine smiles. So it's the last week when the kids are all at school. So I'm gonna take um I'm going to take advantage of that and do two big uh, I did a longer day yesterday, easier day today, rest. I'm not sure about tomorrow. And then I'm going to do two big back-to-back days of between eight and 10 hours. The first day I don't have any childcare, so I'm just literally going to drop them at school and I'm going to keep going until I have to pick them up. Oh, and then um, and then the next day, Bryn's working from home, so I'm going to be able to go out into the dark. So the longer day will be in the second day. I prefer when I do back-to-back days to do the longer first day. And I the would prefer the longer day. first day, yeah. <laughs> but, and I said that to Bryn, he was like, exactly, that's why you have to do it like this. Oh, I love it. So oh, he's taking it. You know, it's so good because I can, you know, when you're out doing these big long days, especially at the moment when there's not, I haven't got anywhere to go, so I'm having to repeat on Monday. I just had to go round the same bit, whatever's cleared, and it might be, you know, if I find a cleared path, I just have to then use that path. But I know I can't go home because he'd be like, get back out there what are you doing yeah. you need to get back out this is your chance this is your training slot get out there you're yeah, only yeah, yeah. so uh i'm kind of looking forward to that um just gonna and I, I i think as well like that is not only really good training but it's almost in some ways bits of that are harder than in the race because you're all by yourself yeah there's nobody to motivate you there's nothing there's no motive like it's literally just ticking down the hours and I am literally just ticking down the hours of the train now that will this will be my last really big week and then I'll probably do one more big day with the pack yeah around Christmas and then come the end of December I will not do very much I'm being a little bit reluctant to go on my skis because my calves and stuff will be off the skis Eddie but it's so much fun Gary I know I know (laughs) So I don't ever very rarely ski on Christmas week anyway, because it is so busy um, and you spend more time queuing for lifts. Whereas as soon as January comes, everyone <laughs> has to go back to work and there's no one on the mountain. So I, I, I'll try to be like, look, it'll all, you know, by the end of January, um, you can be on your skis then for a couple of months. So yeah, last few big days, really working on my fueling, really working on my kit, really working on all the admin stuff of looking after myself. Yeah head torch drills all sorts of stuff like that dialing it all in and trying not to overthink what is coming it's fascinating i well fundamentally do not fancy this race whatsoever but <laughs> <laughs> just the timing of it too i'm thinking wow you've got such a crucial part as you're going into the festive period yeah. to, to keep focused over that time yeah. of year but you know what awesome. i'm doing is i'm trying to draw on all these like lovely family bits that we have and we haven't got anyone coming to stay for christmas which i think is the first one quite which is quite nice because it'll be quiet even though we'll be quite busy with the kids skiing and stuff yeah. we don't have to host and so we don't have to you know we can really do our own thing but i'm trying to draw on all these like warm family bits to Mm. block out what is coming because otherwise that's not fair on the family but also to remember them to like draw on it when i'm feeling like horrendous and i want to stop of being like you you know you you owe this to your family to get unless you know the limb is hanging off i'm going to carry on because my family have supported me so much and think so much of me like i like the kids like if i came back and i was like yeah i stopped kids it was too hard they'd be like everything you've told us mom is a lie (laughs) 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 you are alive so uh even though like yeah you'd want it really ideally done before christmas i'm trying to separate in my brain that's why i'm like big week this week and then you know i'm going to close the door on it for otherwise it's exhausting it's exhausting to constantly be like living in that state of nervous anticipation because i know come january that countdown of the days will be five days till i go four days till i go oh my and... god it makes me feel sick let's Our talk about you. <laughs> you've got a race <laughs> dude tell well... us about what's gonna happen come on, sandbagging come it. on. sandbagger sandbagger <laughs> alert sandbagger alert yeah, gary, yeah he's... To the sandbagging aisle please gary to the sandbagging aisle <laughs> Uh, to the hell of Ellen. yeah it is uh, saturday which is what's the stats on this race miles vert checkpoints i think you know it, it's an awesome you see if you want to do lakeland 100 training but you don't want to go maybe over to coniston and those parts of the other lake or down to ambleside and places like that it's pretty much two to one so the same ratio is typically what you get on the lakeland 100 so i think it's about 35 36 miles and about seven thousand feet of elevation and you know looking at the course there's some runnable bits some climbs you do the passes so it's a great 
if you want to do a 30 odd mile Lake 100 training day, and some of it's the same part anyway, you know, you do uh, around the whole town. So, yeah, it's all good. Robbo and I, well, you know, it's not a given that we're going to stay together over 30 odd miles. Um, I'd say you probably you will be listening to this. I'd say Robbo is probably a bit better shape than me. Um, while I've lost focus the last six weeks, I think he's kind of chugged along um, on plan. But hopefully, which is going to put me a bit out of my comfort zone. I'm going to be there with my microphone. And uh, some people will be listening to this show after I've done the event. But yeah, if you're there and you want a few minutes on the podcast, then you give me a tap on the shoulder. <laughs> but there's not, you know, my goal is for Gary's the day. Dream. Tap him on the shoulder. Are you Gary from the podcast? Gary from the podcast. <laughs> but my goal is for the day. A, have a good time. Get around um, without any injuries or maybe aggravate the knee anymore. I'd like as a goal, maybe get back before dark. That's that would be nice psychologically to get in before the sun completely goes. Other than that, yeah, just have a good day out, good night out with Neil and other kind of competitors out on the course. It's because it's like a this uh I'm struggling for the word here. It's it's like a time trial, it's a staggered start. You can start oh, when you okay. want. Okay. So you you because because there's an issue with the first checkpoint opens up as, at a certain time. So there's no point. If you're say one people, someone who's going to win it, for argument's sake, setting off too early because you're going to get there before the checkpoint opens, and you'll just be hanging around. So there's issues uh, to do with start times, um, but yeah, it's a staggered start. For some people, it would literally just feel like a time trial. Um, you're just running your own race. Everybody around you could be in a complete, completely different race, different goals for the day. So maybe some someone say like Jasmine, who would start a bit later on. She'll just be zooming past people all day, which would be quite uplifting, actually, as, as a run. Um, Are you going to say to her as she passes you, it's Gary! It's Gary from Podcast! <laughs> Green Jasmine! runners! Green runners! <laughs> Jasmine! Quick word! <laughs> yeah. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> is Emma Stewart down to do it as well? I'm not. I haven't. I should have looked at the. Um... The people I'd heard were Jasmine, uh, Mark Derbyshire, and that's as far as my intel got. Quite a few listeners from the show that I know about, and probably quite a few listeners that I don't know about too. So yeah, really looking forward to if you see me there, crying. Are you going to be wearing Gary? Him. Goodness me, I haven't got a clue. Um, I usually oh, go all black. outfit. No, no, no. It's usually, usually black. Trainers wise, yeah, I've just had a few. Messages with people, what shoes I'm going to wear. I think I'm going for the Solomon S Lab Cross Twos. <sighs> like a booty, booty shoe. Quite grippy. Oh, okay. Yep. But the weather over here um, is, you know, it's going to be really icy. I don't suppose it's going to be too muddy. Maybe around the bottom of Helvellyn might be quite muddy. There's never a perfect shoe. There's so much. There's even bits on tarmac. It's, it's an impossible Course Stop her. Nikki yeah. Spinks would not be there. She'd hate it. But yeah, that's me. Hopefully it goes well. Hopefully I'm all smiles next week. Can I just say thanks to everyone, Eddie? I've been blown away by the support that we've had uh, this past week. And to see ourselves at the top of the charts yesterday was pretty wild to say the least. Did you so, have yeah. a cry? I did have a little little tear. Yeah, I got a bit of mush with that. It was awesome to see. I got that. a bit. I got a bit emotional. But you sent it to me when I was like out in the depth of a snowstorm, <laughs> and I was like, "All oh, these people, so nice to feel the love when you yeah. uh, you don't feel it. You know, it's not it's not there. You can't see it, but to feel it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's been a real uh, heartwarming few weeks when we've been kind of getting everything back off the ground but yeah everyone who's joined our facebook group we know we started that from scratch so that was a psychologically that was a struggle for me i wasn't too happy about that but yeah we started from scratch and there's been so many people joined over there our strava group has grown and also our awesome patreon members too over there it's really really supporting and if there's ever a moment where hopefully the audio is okay this week but with patreon in action it was clear for everybody who listened that my audio was not great last week Hopefully you scared a few people with your jingles. <laughs> <laughs> the zoomy jingles. <laughs> but anyway, I dipped into the Patreon pot and I bought myself a new mic. So that is it working um, exactly how it should work. Um, and that was just awesome. And also, if you want to help, I don't think we've got any five-star reviews over on Apple Podcast. And that's really good because that not only looks awesome and we can read those out every week, but it also helps Apple put our podcast in front of people who they think might want to listen to this kind of content. So it's super important. Okay, I didn't know that. I like oh, yes, it. Yes. The, all the, uh, the algorithm 
uh, works in our favor. So yeah, big, big thank you for Mehdi and I. It has been a pretty overwhelming at times and just a wonderful couple of weeks as we've been getting everything back going again. I hope you will have a great week. Send your prayers for me. Actually, by the time most of you listen to this, I will be knee deep into the terrible long days, but send a prayer for Eddie. Run well, run wise, refuel with tea and perhaps now even a mince pie. I had two already today. And um, yes, yes, it's looking like a third will not be far off, Gary. Um, so I, I have no shame. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. I'm Eddie Sutton. And I'm Gary Thwaites. And that was episode two of Tea and Trails. <laughs>